you were going to go into uh, racing class a little bit. I was wondering if you would speak just a little bit about whatever you were going to go into earlier. It quite often, it depends on, on your value base. My value base is quite often government is very engaged and involved in the lives of the poor. And if you look at the poor, disproportionately, who are represented, right? And so disproportionately, um, quite often the recipients of what the services from organizations are going to be African American or Latino. I mean, that's just been what we've seen. Of course, um, when you do something nationally, you see other changes. And what we were noticing, or what I would notice, is that in some of the social entrepreneurial organizations earlier on, and Kim knows this too, probably wasn't the most diverse leadership that we could have seen. And I think that um, there, there was. Um, almost a little bit of, of arrogance and hubris around how um, they were the best to do the service in all communities without any discussion of race or class. And so didn't mean that we couldn't bring up another institution that had been around for a long time that has starkly worked with each of these populations to build their capacity. It was as if they don't function. It's either you're us or you're not in. That just happened to overlap with race and class. You went to a pedigreed school, you were white, most likely male, and you were sitting at the policy table. It just so happens that you also were Democrat and wanted to work with people who were disenfranchised, right? So, the, so that was a very interesting time for me. So it was, you know, so I'm sitting in a room and, and, and we're sitting there and I'm saying, wow, this hasn't, how has this changed? How has this changed? You know, I could be in a GOP room, <laughs> you know? Um, and it's changed. It has changed since then. I'm not saying that it hadn't. And it's not, again, you have to separate the people from the principles as well. And you have to think about what are the other pieces that came out of it. I think there were many humbling moments. There were quite a few social entrepreneurs that went into communities that realized you just can't go in top down. That um, if you don't have citizen buy-in or a bit of the more the organic piece there, if you even think about recruiting for someone locally from that community that was really seen as a partner to you and not someone subservient to you, that it wasn't going to be successful in some places. So I think there was a lot of lessons around race and class that happened. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely say around class, some of the some of the biggest lessons were um, just for myself being an urban inner city person was. And we, uh, you know, when you travel through the country, um, some of the uh, you want to talk about outcome-based project. Um, in Appalachia, it was putting up street signs. Ambulances didn't know where to go. Right? I mean, that was they worked with the police department. Right? It was a very different. That is a very different. And then we did separate grants to tribes. Right? Nobody was championing doing work. In, in tribal communities. To this day, I still haven't seen Native, Amer Native American community that probably has the most vulnerable youth population in this mm -hmm. country engaged in kind of a platform around social entrepreneurship. So, you know, I think it's, these are areas that we need to continue to work on. I don't think that they're the worst things. It's America, right? So, uh, so I, and you know, I know we'll see changes. It, I think race and class and social entrepreneurship is a huge topic that we could spend, you know, two hours on. So I'm going to add a few kind of random thoughts. One is that um, I think there has been, uh, it, over the past, say, ten years, uh, a sort of a, a fetish of who is and who isn't a social entrepreneur, and a lot of um, energy spent on definitions, and are you in the club, are you out of the club? And, um, we would really like to try to dispel that and focus much more on what people are actually doing and how they're doing it versus how they describe themselves or whether they identify. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are people from every walk of life who have incredibly innovative ideas and who are delivering great results. Having said that, I think it, it would be fair to say that we still have a situation where the, the um, social entrepreneurs that are scaling the fastest and that are creating brand names are by and large from the coast. They're by and large Absolutely. highly educated. Yes. Maybe a little bit more racial diversity these days, but still mm -hmm. not very much uh, mm -hmm. class diversity. And, mm -hmm. and that is a problem, and it's a problem that we really need to counter. And um, 
we're thinking of all different ways to do it. I mean, part of it is about recruitment, part of it is about organizations like Echo and Green and Ashoka who go earlier into the pipeline mm -hmm. than New Profit, being more deliberate about cultivation. It's about outreach and um, there, you know, it's about helping make the, the um, risk associated with choosing a career in the social sector more accessible to people who yes. um, haven't historically felt like they could take that kind of risk. Um, so there's a lot we can do and that we need to do. Uh, I don't think it's insurmountable, but it definitely needs some attention. And it's something we're very much aware of. In the America Forward Briefing book, you probably can't see it if you have a photocopy like that, but there's a map that shows you mm -hmm. know, all over the country where these models are, but they are not evenly distributed across this nation. And, and we think that's mostly because we don't know what's happening out there, but also because of these other more systemic factors that we also need to address.